I stand by it wholeheartedly because it will be a disaster if India was also Olympic. First and foremost, we are not a sporting superpower. It's not just stadia, it has to be hotel rooms, it has to be roads, it has to be subway. It comes with a whole, the, the, the checklist for conducting an Olympics is huge. And I think it will be a misadventure if we, if we go on that path. And we shouldn't be doing it just for vanity's sake. In that case, we'll be right to say that there were certain things that the BGP could have also done right in the past. Since of course, there are many things every party does right and many, many things they don't do right. I mean, on a broader principle, I don't agree with the BJP's narrative of India. Their narrative of India is a Hindi Hindutva India. Do you believe that voicing these uh, statements or putting out these statements saying that BJP and uh, the communists are the only two parties which are not being run by a single family? are against your party line or is it just something that you... you know, that's a, that's a sociological fact. I mean, Every political party, barring these two political parties, the fulcrum of those political parties is some dominant family. Every political party is has got a centrality of a family around which people congre congregate and the party functions and that's the social reality of India. Hello and welcome to One India. Joining me today is two-time member of parliament from the Siva Ganga constituency and son of a congress stalwart, Mr. Karthi Chidam. My first question to you, Mr. Chidambaram. You have publicly voiced your opinion in the recent past about the Congress having voiced opinions against its alliance partner, DMK, on certain pertinent issues. And you also faced severe backlash from certain party members like Mr. Elan. What would you like to say about that? And would be right to say that you do not hold the party line at all? It's the, it's, it's, the party has not been in government since 1967. So it's going to be close to 60 years since we were in government last. And the political space is getting rather crowded in Tamil Nadu with established political parties, new entrants, and with fledging new entrants who are aspiring to come into the space. So the space for the Congress party is going to get squeezed out. So if we need to be noticed, recognized, and endorsed, we need to carve out our own niche and our own unique uh, space. And for that, we need to take up causes. We must be the voice of the voiceless. We must speak about contemporary issues in Tamil Nadu. And uh, that's what a political party does. A political party can't remain silent. A silent political party is not noticed, will not be supported. So what I say is, is basic common sense which should apply to the functioning of any political entity in anywhere. It's not unique or it's not some unique idea or a completely out of the box idea I'm coming up with. I'm just saying basic bread and butter things which political parties need to do in any 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 kind of electoral uh, space. If it wasn't for your legacy and the family that you come from, do you believe that having not torn the line of the party multiple times and making statements you could have still sustained in the party? I, I do not understand from where you believe that I'm not towing the party line. I am completely committed to the Congress uh, party. The Congress party gives me this space and I don't think anybody can point out or you should be able to point out, you're a journalist, you should have done some research. Tell me one instance where my public pronouncements is in variance with the Congress party's position. Okay, sir. You believe that it is in sync with what the party is saying, but there are multiple, obviously, like Mr. Elagwan came out and said that, you know, you wouldn't have been given a ticket uh, had it not been for the DMK uh, supporting the candidature? The point is not, I'm, my ticket is not given by the DMK. My ticket is given by the Congress party. I don't know whether, I've heard Mr. Ilangovan. I mean, I have, I respect him. He's, he's as old as my father. But he does not necessarily speak for the, uh, for, for every Congress worker. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether if you even just have a very cursory look on uh, what's been uh, said about his comments. I think the public support and the support from the cadre is completely with me with what I said. So I'm not in variance with the party at all. I mean, this just because I'm outspoken and I speak issues and I'm not silent and below the radar does not mean that I'm in variance with my party. I'm in completely in sync with the party and I'm grateful for the party for giving me the space to be myself. Please correct me if I'm wrong, if I could extend what you said. You essentially meant that political parties in India today should have an issue-specific stance. Meaning that if you're aligning one end with one political entity, it does not mean that you support absolutely everything. Absolutely. Uh, do you believe that at nationwide, this is a problem today, not only at a political level, but also at a citizen or a voter level, wherein if you support the left, 
everything that the left does. Agree. Like you don't have to agree with everything a political party does, and just because you have an electoral alliance with another political party, does and that political party being the dominant political party in the alliance, does not mean that you need to accept them in every other issue. So, I mean, we will have variances. If we don't have variances, we might as well merge into one entity. Why would we have a unique identity, a unique uh, political structure, if we are not going to st have our own views? I mean, I mean, I, 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 just because we have differences doesn't mean we are at war. I mean, uh, we, we come together on some broad ideas, but we will have differences in, 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 in other things. I mean, how can we not have differences? Uh, it was natural. For example, the DMK's position as far as the release of the Rajiv Gandhi uh, convicts, I mean, we are at variance with them. I mean, uh, we, we don't agree with their position on that. But that does not mean that's a deal breaker. But we believe in federalism. They also believe in federalism. We believe that you know, India needs a secular government. They also believe that. So there are congruities which come in on a broader principle. But there will be variances on other issues as well. And just because we are an alliance does not mean that we will not, we don't, we don't have the political right to voice our opinion on issues uh, of the day, which we have to. If we don't voice our issues uh, um, uh, about issues of the day, how will people notice us or how will people endorse us or how will people even re reach out to us? In that case, would it be right to say that there were certain things that the BJP could have also done right in the past since 2014? Of course, there are many things every party does right and many, many things they don't do right. I mean, on a broader principle, I don't agree with the BJP's narrative of India. Their narrative of India is a Hindi, Hindutva India, which I don't accept with. But of course, they get so many things right. I mean, they, I mean, particularly this Prime Minister's push towards technology, he's got it right. He, he understands that technology can break many barriers and I think uh, he's right on that. But his societal view is not something I agree with. It does not mean uh, every government builds on the shoulders of the previous government. I mean, no government can uh, uh, can negate what the previous government did. Economic progress or technological progress or societal progress is built on the shoulders of the previous generation and the government. And that's natural. Of course, every, I, I would not say that they've got everything wrong. Of course, they've got, they, there are a few things they, they, which are working out. But ideologically, their societal view and their view on how they sh they, the agency should function and the control which the, the central government must exercise over the states and over individual liberty is something which I don't agree with. In fact, on a very fun note today, if we Google Karthi Chidambaram, I think we see ED, CBI more than anything else. Yeah, so unfortunate, I don't have an agency which is going to do rub off. This is, then, then there's, there's something known as a forget me clause in, on, on internet. Maybe I should hire somebody to do that. It's unfortunate. I mean, uh, they, they have done. But what has happened to those cases? Nothing has happened to those cases. We've been hearing about this for the past decade. They're all, nobody bothers to go into the details of them. And if you go into the details of them, you will understand how absurd those charges are. And these charges will all die a natural death in the, in the course of time. So in a recent interview, you went on to say that there are only two parties which are not run by one particular family in the country. One is the Communists and the other is the BJP. Going forward, we hear reports of Mr. Vadeni and Stalin being elevated to the position of a Deputy Chief Minister. Uh, how do you see this? And don't, do you believe that voicing these... Uh, statements or putting out these statements saying that BJP and uh, the communists are the only two parties which are not being run by a single family are against your party line or is it just something that you... you know, that's a, that's a sociological fact. I mean, every political party, barring these two political parties, the fulcrum of those political parties is some dominant family, right from the national conference. I mean, I mean, it's just the Congress gets a disproportionate amount of attention, right from the national conference in Kashmir, or even the PDP in Kashmir, or the Akali Dal in uh, in uh, Punjab, or the Shiv Sena, the both versions of Shiv Sena and the NCP in Maharashtra, the the, the Biju Janata Dal in uh, in uh, in Orissa, the TMC in uh, Bengal, the TDP and the BRS, the DMK and the and and then the one which is the most family dominated political party is the JDS of, uh, of Karnataka. So every political party is, has got a centrality of a family around which people congre congregate and the party functions and that's the social reality of India. It's not unique to India alone, it's unique to Sri Lanka, the same in Bangladesh, it's the same in Pakistan. If you go to Pakistan, the, 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 the Pakistan People's Party is completely visible uh, around the family of, uh, of the Bhutos. If you go to the, uh, the, the, the other party, the, the Nawaz Sharif's party is, is again 
is dominated by their family. You go to Sheikh Hazina or Khalida Zia in Bangladesh, their, their families dominate the parties. You go to Sri Lanka, it is the, either the Rajapakshas or the Kumaratungas or the Bandaranaikas or the Jayavardhanes or even Mr. Vikramasinghe, who is currently the president, is a nephew of Jayavardhane. So, it's not unique to India. It's, it's a South Asian phenomenon. In fact, the country which has the greatest amount of family influence on politics in the world is, some, is surprisingly, which people don't know the answer, is Japan. 70% of members of parliament in Japan in the diet come from, uh, come from political family. So, this is not a unique situation for the Congress party or the DMK. This is what India is. This is what South Asia is. This is a sociological fact. That's what I'm stating. I'm not stating anything against the political party or for a political party. I completely understand the emotional bond which people have is, 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 is towards their, their, their love, affection and admiration, uh, hero worship, whatever you might call, towards families and those families then perpetuate leaderships and political structures are built around those families and that's the sociological fact in India. I mean, there are two completely different narratives when it comes to the first family of the Congress. Now, while once one narrative says it, it's a binding force, it keeps the party together, there's a completely different narrative which also says it's counterproductive to the party in the long run, and that is what has brought the Congress. No, I don't think so. I think it's a binding force. I think I don't buy the counter narrative because uh, this is what keeps the party together. The, the 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 bond which the average worker has with the Nehru Gandhi family is something unique, and it definitely binds the party together. And uh, there is. Uh, and I, I, I can't, uh, I, I, the way things are today in India, I would absolutely think it's absolutely necessary to have this centrifugal force uh, which binds the party together. And for the foreseeable future, you think that's how it should be? As I think this will be how it will be in the foreseeable future across all political parties in India. It's not just necessarily only the, the only party which is trying to sort of break away from this mold is the uh, is the ADMK because it's technically not family even though from MGR Jayalalitha inherited it even though she had a uh, very close association with him and now the party is breaking away we have to see how successful they are going to be but no other party has done it successfully even the much uh, talked about Mr. Vaiko what did he do he broke away from the DMK citing the the, uh, the ascent of uh, Mr. Stalin, he did not like the ascent of Mr. Stalin, started his own party and what has happened to his party today? I mean, his anointed successor, his son, his whole idea of breaking away from DMK was because he, he did not like the idea of, of Mr. Stalin succeeding Mr. Karunanidhi. But then he starts his own political party and his successor is his son. Mamata Banerjee broke away from the Congress, citing that she was not given space in the Congress. Who is her anointed successor? It's her nephew. Mayavati inherited the party from Kanshi Ram, she was a close associate, who is her anointed successor, her nephew. I mean, so it's not unique to the Congress or the DMK. Unfortunately, the DMK and the Congress get sort of painted by this brush every now and then. But every other political party, even go to the smaller political parties uh, all over India, that's necessarily the same. So, I completely agree that multiple parties, I mean, it's a South Asian phenomenon like you pointed out, but is it the right way of serving the people? Well, that's, that the point is, as society changes, maybe 50 years from now, 25 years from now, 100 years from now, maybe the political party structures also will change. Uh, political party structures also will change. But see, political parties are a reflection of society. I mean, as society changes, political parties also will change uh, in, that, in, that, in that manner and form. So, we sort of skipped a part of my question. What is your opinion on Mr. Ravindi being elevated? If that's the, that's the prerogative of, of the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. He's, he, he's, he's the president of the party. He's the, he's the Chief Minister. He could make anybody he wants a minister. He could demote anybody. He could promote anybody. It's his prerogative. I mean, we have, I have no real opinion about that. It's, he is the chief minister, it's his government and the constitution allows him to elevate, demote or, uh, or induct anybody of his choice and, that, and, and it's completely his prerogative and I have no opinion on that. The BJP in Tamil Nadu is to an extent celebrating the 11% odd vote share that they have celebrated. Erroneously, erroneously celebrating. Uh, and uh, you who hardly celebrated. You in the past had gone to the extent of saying Mr. Anumala is nobody in the context of Tamil Nadu. You but think today he's, 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 he's actually a punctured balloon. In fact, if you know, it says because he's over-promised and under-delivered. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he was a stock in the market, he he's tanked completely because he completely over-promised. He said that they will be the dominant political force taking on the India alliance here, that he himself is going to win handsomely in Coimbatore and his other candidates in his alliance are going to win and they are going to gain some significant vote share. And this 11% vote share which you claim that they have is not their vote. 
it is not a pure BJP vote. The BJP had alliances in Tamil Nadu. They had caste party alliances in Tamil Nadu, the PMK for example, and much other smaller caste community parties who contested on their symbol. For example, even in Sivaganga, the, even though the contestant was on a BJP symbol, he wasn't a BJP party member. He was from another community caste-based organization who runs his own outfit. He contested on a BJP symbol. So there was a little bit of a caste community consolidation. So if you take away all that caste community consolidation votes which the BJP got because of this alliance, they would come back to single digits where they always belong to. And Mr. Annamala himself, you know, the kind of promises he was making before the election have been completely deflated. I and mean, even cursorily, if you look at what's happening in the districts, you will see the BJP's presence has gone down in the last few months. Visibly, you will not see uh, BJP flags. You will not see cars having BJP flags going around. So, in my opinion, the BJP is on a downward spiral in Tamil Nadu because they over-promised and very badly underperformed. Your opinion that the Congress should not compromise and speak up on issues and, and to an extent stand on its own footing in Tamil Nadu. How is it different from what Mr. Annamalai said about the BJP breaking away from the alliance? And the he, he speaks for his party. He has to do what he believes is right for his party. I have to do what is right for my party. Whatever I say is from my party's perspective. I am not his consultant to give him ideas on how to run his party. My, my idea would be to shut shop and go home. Uh, for his party. We are hearing reports from our sources that he might be going on a sabbatical very soon. Good. It's actually good for many politicians to go on sabbatical. I think it's, I mean, I did read it too. I think it'll good. It'll open their eyes and mind to other perspectives and it takes, it takes them away from the cacophony. In fact, I'd, I'd recommend that for all politicians. You know, anybody who says there's a, they are a 24-7 politician, I don't believe them. I don't think anybody can be a 24-7 politician. You must have other interests. You must widen your uh, perspective horizon. And it's good. I, in fact, I, I, mean, I mean, I don't have anything personal against him. I, I mean, I'm, he's very cordial with me whenever he meets me. And I wish him well. I think, I know he's going to, uh, I read that he's going to Oxford. It'll do him good. I think, it's, I think all major political personalities must take a sabbatical, must go out and read, reflect, meet people from outside their own comfort zones. So they broaden their horizons and particularly travel abroad. Not, traveling abroad opens your eyes up and I, I would encourage that and I'm glad he's doing it. And one of your recent tweets spoke against India hosting the Olympics. Um, and I stand by it wholeheartedly because it will be a disaster if India hosts the Olympics. First and foremost, we are not a sporting superpower. For us, first goal should be that we must become a dominant force in the sporting world by winning things significantly, which we are not. Even in this Olympics, our, unfortunately, our performance will be very, very modest. I, uh, I mean, I mean I, as it is, a few, a few medal hopes, fulls have already fallen by the wayside. A few more are there. But our performance will be very, very modest in this Olympics. Secondly, holding an Olympics has huge costs. And you create infrastructure which will never use it again. Because we don't have the sporting leagues which can use these infrastructures constantly. If you even do an audit of existing stadia in India, you will realize that we use it very, very sparingly. And the Olympics itself is a very expensive project and we must learn lessons from uh, Athens and Rio, which have been complete disasters. It's okay for first world countries, which already have tremendous infrastructure, to just add on a little bit more to conduct Olympics. But for countries which don't have that kind of infrastructure, it's not just stadia, it has to be hotel rooms, it has to be roads, it has to be subway. It comes with a whole, the, the, the checklist for conducting an Olympics is huge. And I think it will be a misadventure if we, if we go on that path. And we shouldn't be doing it just for vanity's sake. My next uh, question has two parts. One, who's supposed to be blamed for India not being a sporting superpower today? Society. Uh, you say that people in power... All no, nothing to do with power. I mean, it's got nothing to do with government. You see, our society, we, 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 we put so much emphasis on, on our schooling system, which is examination, homework, tuition uh, focused. And uh, we don't, we are not a sporting society. I mean, I always say that. Have you ever seen an entire family playing a sport? What do families do? They either go to a temple, they'll go to a restaurant, or they'll go shopping, or they'll go to some function. I've never seen a mother, father, and two children in a park kick a ball or play a sport. I've never seen uh, families play sport. If you look at all other countries which do very well, their societies are sports-oriented. Families play sport. Sport is part of their daily life. But sport is not part of our daily life. And particularly for girls, it's a huge barrier to, to, to societal barrier to even to go out and play. So, and we don't have enough playgrounds. Uh, schools don't encourage sports enough. Uh, PT teachers are not treated very well. They are just sort of, you know, there because they need to be there. And until we make physical education 
a core subject and compulsory for writing public exams, we won't be a sporting power. So unless society itself becomes a part, uh, we, are, we can't be a nation of, of spectators, we need to be a nation of participants. And then hopefully because of the millions and billions we have, champions will slowly start coming. But we have to broaden the base. For that, instead of hosting the Olympics, you must build playing fields which are accessible to everybody and also make sure there are coaches at the grassroots level. Sports is very technical, you can't play a sport without technical coaching and technical coaching has to be at the grassroots level. There are a lot of things we can do to get it right instead of, of, of trying to hold the Olympics and things like that and change society. But the biggest change I would advocate is to write a public exam, you need to have a basic fitness. So you have to run say a mile in seven minutes or something like that. Unless you put that as a compulsory physical condition to write a public exam, kids today, parents today won't force their children to get fit. That's what you really need. So my next few questions, rather a couple of them may not be essentially political, but it's an extension of what you said last. Uh, one of the serving IS officers from the Telangana Kada recently put out a statement that said, in connection with the recent UPSC controversy, where she said that if defense and if in the Indian police service, uh, a, a, a reservation is not handed out to the different able, the Indian administrative service also is physically demanding. Therefore, this service should also not extend a reservation. I completely defendant. disagree with the statement. I've read that. I think I forget her name. Sabarwal, I think her name was. I completely disagree and uh, with her statement. I think uh, the civil service must have people from diverse backgrounds, so they will bring in a, 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 a diverse perspectives to, uh, to the administrative service. And I think differently abled people must be given uh, a certain leg up to come through, the, come into the service. I, I agree, I disagree with her completely. This points at a very larger debate on reservations in general and for the longest time, intellectuals have been debating about it. And they also have gone to the extent of saying maybe it's time to look at reservations based on economic background and not caste divide. What is your opinion? Well, we could move towards an economic criteria, but we need data for that. Without data, you can't move towards that. You know, people live in joint families. So you might not actually have any uh, assets in your name, but you still come from a very uh, comfortable background. So there are, uh, see for example, this, this reservation which we give for medical colleges and engineering colleges for government schools, that's a good step. Because people who go to government schools are economically and socially uh, um, deprived and they are the ones who are at the lower end of the totem pole. That's a good step. So if you say anybody who studied in a government school from say standard six, all the way to standard 12, they should be given some criteria. I think that's a welcome step. So we need to come up with other markers. But merely because we do have assets or li liabilities, I mean, you could be part of a large uh, joint family and you could be, a, you could actually live in a billionaire's uh, joint family and not have any assets on your name. Because this comes from a place where a lot of people belong to the forward class as well who may not have access to. I understand, I understand. That's why we have to go through this economic criteria. Economic criteria could be a criteria, but we need data for that. We don't have data for that. We don't have individual uh, data for, for for an 18 year old whether they they are, have access so the access to to government school uh, or to a private school that could be a good de de demarcating factor so we need to come up with other matrices not merely do you have wealth or no wealth because it can be very misleading will it be right to say that political parties will never do away with caste based reservations only no, but, 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 but you can't see i don't believe in caste i negate caste i don't belong to any caste and i I, I never ever uh, have ever said that I, I, I have affinity or I, 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 I show um, you know belonging to any kind of particular socio uh, caste group. I don't do that. But the point is that it is a reality in India. There is caste based uh, discrimination. Uh, that we have to accept that social reality and that reality must also be acknowledged and that must be a factor. But whether that's only going to be the factor and we're going to negate economic factors, I don't think so. But to have economic factors, you need data, but we don't have data. Where is the data? How do we, how do we gauge this? So as I said, we need to come up with reasonably acceptable parameters by which we can uh, use other than merely caste uh, identification. I agree with that, but you need to come up with those matrix. Uh, ma ma matrix. But the, nobody has come up with that matrix. I think the government school is one particular factor which can be used, but we have to come up with other factors as well. Sir, post the 2024 Lok Sabha elections, do you still believe that nobody is a match to Prime Minister Narendra Modi, including Mr. Rao? I Rao. never said that. So I never ever said nobody is a match. I only, I mean, again, you have, you have not listened to my interview properly. All I said is nobody can match his propaganda. And he is a propaganda machine, but even propaganda comes to an end and it has come to an end and uh, his, 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 when his propaganda is failing with his core constituencies, the middle class, the middle class is abandoning him. I am telling you this categorically today. Mr. Narendra Modi and the BJP are on a downward spiral. 
the, the next government will be a Congress-led government in this country. It is very clear. The BJP has lost its goodwill, has lost its uh, you know, freshness, and it's a tired political party with a tired government. And this government is on a downward spiral. And the next government, whenever that ele next elections happen, five years or even earlier than that, will be a Congress-led government in India. Sir, apart from being a politician, uh, you're also a father. I mean, there's this alarming trend online nowadays, which I wanted to comment on. Uh, while social media can always be a double-edged sword, it can be used for propagating the right things. It can also be used to tarnish or tame somebody's psychological health. Uh, lately, we see that for the sake of likes, followers, etc. Uh, in the name of content creation or freedom of content creation, people have been resorting to all sorts of things. A person was recently arrested for placing a cylinder on a, on a railway track, etc. So what is your take on where this stops and what is... I, I don't think that we can really have government regulation which, can, which will be effective. Uh, government regulation can only be, will also be one-sided because then government will only regulate it in a manner in which is, which, which people who are, who are putting out views against the government will get uh, persecuted, others will go away. But this kind of, uh, it's a free-for-all, you know, you need to have technological tools, it must have only personal uh, boundaries and how you behave, societal rules, that's the only way. I don't think you can legislate good behavior online, it's very, very difficult and technology is, is, is adapting and growing at such a fast pace, I don't think any legislation can, can keep pace with it. So it's only, you know, personal behavior, you know, good practices, society as a whole coming up and behaving in a certain way. Because we, we all have collective behavior norms. There are no rules. I mean, I mean when, when, I, when, I, when we go to a temple, we dress in a particular way. When you go to a wedding, we behave in a certain way. We go to a restaurant. So only society must evolve those rules and behave by those rules. I really don't believe that government regulation or, uh, or legislation or, or police action is going to bring. But if somebody is indulging in dangerous behavior, yes, um, the law has to take its course. Perhaps um, exemplary punishment will also be a deterrent, but that might not necessarily be the case. It's not easy to control it. How does it impact the psychological health of the next generation? See, the psychological health, we, we never pay attention to mental health in India. In my opinion, okay. about 33% of this country is depressed. We hardly have access to men, mental health care professionals. With some, because of the way our society and family structures are, we always brush aside mental health issues. It's not as if so, social media is making mental health worse. Mental health has is, is already been bad, particularly women don't talk about it, the children don't talk about it and we as a society are a repressed uh, society. We never ever uh, express our emotions openly even within family structures because they are so formal. So this is a societal problem, this is not a social media induced uh, mental health problem in India. So right from Olympians to actors, lately a lot of people have been coming out and talking about mental health being a very severe yeah. issue. Simone Biles in fact backed out of one day okay, despite being the favourite uh, to back the gold medal. But in politics, Somehow there is this sense that a politician or a leader is supposed to be spotless, is not supposed to speak about having problems or committing mistakes. There isn't possibly a single politician who has come out and spoken about his, his or her mental health issues. I think, is, I, I think that's an unfortunate situation because we put politicians as larger than life. That's the point is that we make heroes out of people very quickly. That's why when somebody asked me in a recent interview whether I have a role model, I said I have no role models because every role model will disappoint you at some point of time. I think we have to be humanistic, we have to be realistic and you know we as a society also don't have any self-deprecating humour, we never look inwards, we're always uh, hectoring and lecturing to the, to the large extent and I think it should change and I hope the newer, younger leaders will, will, will have no compunctions in talking about their emotions and about their ups and downs. And I think mental health is a serious issue in India. Uh, I think uh, we don't have access, we don't talk about it, we don't uh, encourage people to talk about it. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's a societal problem. Considering you have your own, you have had your own tough phases in the know, My tough phases, I mean, I, I'm, I see, I lead a very privileged life. I still lead a very privileged life. I'm very thankful for God for giving me all those privileges. I have a, a very supportive family. I have the resources to fight this. Yes, I'm being targeted. The only reason I'm being targeted is because uh, they don't like my father very much because he's a very ardent and articulate critic of the government. So they've done their worst. I mean, this is why, as bad as it can be. But it never impacted your mental health? Of course, it, it, it impacts me. I, I, mean, I mean, my travel is impacted. My businesses are impacted. I have to deal with it. I, do, I didn't succumb to it, but I have to deal with it. Of course, it 
right? It impacts me. It's not easy dealing with court cases and, and, and ridiculous summons all the time. It does. It, that's what the process is the punishment. But the point is, the institutions which need to step in to stop this harassment, don't step in to st stop the harassment. That's why it goes on. But then after a while, you get used to it and you deal with it. And I have dealt with it. Some people survive, some people don't. And obviously, I've survived and I've, I've thrived. That's the whole point. How do you deal with it when people use words like trinka, quote unquote? Oh, I don't take social media. See, I have a good laugh. And I don't take it. I'm sure it's, 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 it's... See, this is again, these are all anonymous trolls. These was, they, they'll never have the courage to come and say that to my face. They will never have the courage to stand in a public area and say it. You know, this, this is the dark web gives them this kind of courage to say what they want to say. They, in fact, I, I, it's one way to clean up the web is to, is to make sure that nobody can ever uh, be anonymous on the web. That you have, you have to be, I, I don't know how you can achieve that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's there if they want to have their opinion, they can have that. I'm the one who's having the last laugh. I went to Wimbledon, I went to Parliament, but they're still there in their dark holes calling me what they want to call. And in a recent uh, speech that you gave uh, in the Parliament, you also mentioned that 47 or 49 rupees is what? 75,500 uh, rupees? 17,500 17, rupees per annum of saving would lead up to, and that would only suffice for buying your geo recharge. Coincidentally, the person who called for India hosting the Olympics is also Ms. Nita Ambani. So the, online, there are a lot of people saying that, why is he so upset? Did you speak about the Olympic issue only because she was the one? To no, her? I have been consistent about... Uh, was it we have Reliance and you or you and you is... is, is no, I have, I mean, there. I have no relationship with that organization. I have nothing against them. Uh, but, uh, you know, they are, one, they are the largest corporate in India. And all good luck to them. But the point is, India should not host the Olympics. That's something which I have always maintained. Because as a developing country, this will be a huge financial burden on us. Secondly, we are not a sporting power. We should be focusing on producing more champions instead of hosting large events. Yes, we must hold sporting events, but the Olympics is in a different dimension. The kind of infrastructure we'll have to create for the Olympics will never be used because we do an audit, honest audit of all the stadia we have in India. We don't use them enough, so we do, should not be straddled with the, these stadia, which will cost us a lot of money to build, operate and to maintain. This is not an expense we should be... Creating. Does this start with politicians not taking up roles in sporting federations? No, this has nothing to do with that. You see, the only sporting federation which is profitable is the cricket. Everything else is only a service. Everything else, you need people with public profile file at least to raise money to run the show. So I don't uh, believe in this idea that politicians should not be in sporting bodies. What if a sportsman becomes a politician? Does he then disqualify himself as a, to be in a sporting body? I don't think. I think you need people with various skill sets, commercial, uh, public personas to be in sporting bodies in order to raise the, the, the profile of the sporting body and also to raise money. I've been involved in tennis, but I was a tennis player since I was nine years old. I mean, I've played tournaments throughout India, throughout in, in Europe and Europe, and I've been a tennis player. But then I came into politics. What does it mean? That am I, am I, I cease to be a tennis player and I only become a politician. I can't go back to my tennis federation, which is where I still hold a position. You need people of all skill sets to be in sporting bodies because sporting bodies need those skill sets to run and everybody gets confused by looking at the, the riches of the BCCI and things that every other sporting body is rich. Every other sporting body is not rich. All other sportsmen don't lead glamorous lives. It's very, very difficult to run sporting events in India. People do not come pay to watch these sporting events. There's hardly any sponsorship. So you need people with profile to, to bring in through their goodwill uh, resources into these sporting bodies. But the Olympics has got nothing to do with the who, who's now proposing that we hold the Olympics. It's, I, I have been very, very firm in this and I've steadfastly held this position even when I've spoken about this much earlier. India should not even bid for the Olympics. As speculative as it may sound, on, on the way to 2026, if you were made the person in charge for calling the shots in terms of the Congress, what would you do and how, what are your chances leading up? See, the, the, the Congress uh, president now is Mr. Selva Perindaka. His term is three years, so there's no question of having another president for, for three years. He's only been appointed a few months ago, and I'm sure he'll, he'll be there at least for three years, if not longer. But what I would do is I would strengthen the party organization. We are an aging organization. I would, I would not have multiple office bearers. I'll have limited office bearers who have responsibility and authority and have a genuine membership drive and not a missed call like uh, Facebook, like Twitter, like membership, but genuine membership drive and a limited membership drive, but, but, uh, but a genuine, a verified, authenticated membership drive and run and give a lot of autonomy to district units to choose their own office bearers. Really clean shop within the Congress party before we have any grander amb ambitions outside. So there were multiple phases since 14 where the Congress sort of had this vacuum that they could have run back in 2018 when they won three states etc. It was seen as an opening. 
But unfortunately, the party could not capitalize on that. Or would you say they did, and that's why? They no, no, the, the 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 what happens in another state has no bearing on what happens in Tamil. I'm not talking about Tamil nationally when it comes. No, to I think this has been. I think the narrative against the Congress was set, and for ten years it sort of worked, and people sort of rejected the Congress on a national level, but they were accepting the Congress in a state level. But now the tide has turned. Now going forward, you will see that the, the acceptance of Rahul Gandhi, the acceptance of the Congress party is only going to be greater and greater, and we are going to form the government whenever the next general elections are going to be here. My last question to you. Almost all pollsters got it wrong this time around. Uh, there are few who are saying that this is a dying profession, this industry is bound to end because at the end of the day, if a pollster cannot get numbers right, it's their bread and butter. I mean, somebody hires a pollster or a strategist only for how accurate or precise they can be. So, considering the recent elections, what is your assessment? No, no, I don't think it's 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 a it's a science and an art, and I'm sure if they get got it wrong now. Whether they got it wrong because they, the data crunching was wrong or because they were pressurized to, to give certain results, I don't know. But there were many people on the field who were calling it right, particularly journalists who were working in the UP Bihar area were actually telling me things which, which turned out right, particularly in UP. So I would not uh, uh, blame every cephologist or say this is a dying trade. And uh, you know, this will thrive. You know, I'm sure there are many people who learn from this. And they will also learn to take into extraneous factors which, 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 which exert pressure on them. And they will, they will insulate themselves from that and come up with more uh, robust numbers in the future. I don't think it's a dying trade. Before we conclude, can you confirm if Mr. Vindhi can be elevated and secondly, your political aspirations I have uh, nothing, I have no view at all about it. I have said it again and again. It is a prerogative of the Chief Minister of the state who is constitutionally has got the power to elevate, demote or to induct anybody he chooses or to, to, to drop anybody he chooses. It is complete his prerogative. I have absolutely no view about it. Uh, what are your political aspirations? Well, my ambitions are for the Congress party to be a dominant political party in Tamil Nadu and obviously the Congress party to come to or uh, to, to head the government in the central government and that's that's the goal of every political party. We start a political party because we want now to... Personally, do you... I mean, the, Congress party, the Congress party the Congress party moves in that direction. I'm sure the Congress party will also give me opportunities to move up if the team's fit. But my ambitions are, we are completely, completely have to be in sync and have to be in line and are dependent on the Congress party's success. Lastly, sir, if you had not been so outspoken, do you believe that your I have to be myself. I have to be myself. And uh, if I'm not myself, I would not be true to myself. And I don't think I would be adding value to the political discourse. And the Congress party gives me the space to be myself. Thank you so much, Dr. Okidwa. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you.